All right, if y'all would, open in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, we're going to begin our reading actually a little bit earlier in this chapter. Uh, let's go ahead and read verses 11 through 14, then we'll come back and set the context for it. Hebrews 11, beginning at, or Hebrews 5, beginning in verse number 11. Hebrews 5. Beginning in verse number 11, as you can tell on the board, we're talking about spiritual discernment. Spiritual discernment. The writer of Hebrews says, Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of a full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. When you look at the book of Hebrews, and y'all know this, the writer begins in chapter 1 by talking about the superiority of Christ. Uh, he says in verse number 1 of Hebrews chapter 1 that God who at sundry times and in divers manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. He says in verse 2, He hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being, now watch this, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Verse 4 he says, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by an inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So as the writer is writing in Hebrews chapter 1, the superiority of Christ. When you get to chapter 2, the writer starts talking about the danger of falling away, the dangers of neglecting so great of salvation that we have. And then he moves to the point that Jesus is superior because of his humanity. In chapter 3, Jesus is superior to Moses in uh, every aspect. But as you get to chapter 4, he tells us that we need to be careful. That we don't fall, that we don't drift away from the rest that we have been promised of God. Then we get to chapter 5, and this is where we're getting our text about spiritual discernment. He's telling us in Hebrews chapter 5 that Jesus Christ is not a high priest after the order of Aaron. He could not be a high priest after the order, uh, the order of Aaron. As a matter of fact, he would say it clearly in Hebrews 7 in verse number 14 that Jesus came from the tribe of Levi or excuse me the tribe of Judah and not the tribe of Levi so Jesus could never on this earth serve as a priest or a high priest because he comes from the wrong tribe that means that Jesus Christ is unique and so as the writer of Hebrews is talking about Jesus being a priest after the order of Melchizedek, he tells the writer, or the readers, as we just read a moment ago, that there are many more things, verse number 11, that I would like to say. But these things are hard for me to utter, he says, because you are dull of hearing. Uh, we're going to talk about, as we mentioned a moment ago, spiritual discernment. One of the keys to Having spiritual discernment is the ability to listen. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. These people did not have spiritual discernment because they were dull 
of hearing. Now, of course, we're going to talk about in just a moment what we need to hear because you can listen to a lot of things today. You can listen to a lot of nonsense today. And so the writer is not telling us we need to just listen to everything as if it's equal. You know, that's the mantra of our day, is it not? People tell us that all religions are equal and we've got to uh, choose whichever one fits us best. Or they would tell us all manner of psychology. It's all equal and we just draw from what helps us the most. The writer of Hebrews is saying that is simply not the case. As a matter of fact, he reprimands them in verse number 12 because he said, you should have grown at this point to where you have the ability to teach, but you need somebody to come back and teach you the first principles of the oracles of God. Now when you look at that, that tells us there are things that the Bible designates as first principles. I've heard preachers say, well there's no such things as first principles. Well, <laughs> how can you read Hebrews 5 and verse 12? and not understand there are elementary, fundamental principles of Christianity. And we need to know them. But he said the problem was they had not grown to spiritual maturity, therefore they were unable to eat the strong meat that they needed to eat to talk about doctrines like Melchizedek. We need to, you have to have a deep understanding of the Bible to understand how Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. You were not ready, the writer says. And so I'm going to have to pause, and he says in chapter 6 and verse 1, leave behind those first principles and move on. But notice, they were not ready for strong meat, and he tells us why. Verse 12, you still have need of milk. Now we know that milk is designed for babes. We'll talk about it more in detail in just a moment. But milk by its very nature is the nourishment for babes. And so we need to be on, the writer says, we need to be beyond the milk of the word and we need to be going for the strong meat. So he says in verse 13 that everyone that is still using milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. So we're talking about spiritual discernment. We're talking about growing to maturity where we can look at issues and discern the right and wrong of something. So he says everyone that uses milk, you're still a babe in the word of God, but strong meat belongs to those, he says, that are of full age, that are full grown, they are mature. He says, even those, now how do we become or how do we attain spiritual discernment? Listen to what he says. Even those who by reason of use, brethren, we understand that it takes exercise for us to develop our muscles, right? And you're looking at me and saying, you forgot that. But I'm telling you, it takes exercise to develop muscle. And it takes spiritual exercise to develop spiritual muscle. And that's what the writer is saying. And he goes on to say, they have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now the Bible tells us, and you might just flip over to Matthew chapter 4, and notice that in Matthew chapter 4 that Jesus answered the devil with these words, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So we are to live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That means we are dependent upon the Word of God for every decision and direction that we make. Every decision that a Christian makes needs to have as his fundamental starting point, what does the Word of God say? 
what does the Bible say about this subject? And then we are to desire that word, as we mentioned a moment ago, like a newborn babe. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And notice that the writer tells us, and we're going to go ahead and notice, and I'm sorry, I, I think I want 2 Peter chapter 1 and not 1 Peter. And I do. So 2 Peter chapter 1. No, that's from this morning. Let me go back. 1 Peter chapter 1. How about 1 Peter chapter 2? See, when you got fat fingers, you can't type. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, listen to verse 2, as newborn babes, we are to desire, he says, the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And so we are to desire the word. The word is what sustains us. The word is what we live by. And we are to desire that word just as a newborn babe desires their mother's milk. And so sometimes, brethren, we have a cry for growth. And yet we are unwilling to hear the very word that is going to produce the growth that we need. Numbers in and of themselves in reality don't mean a lot. It is the sustenance that means something. You can have thousands that are lost and everybody looks and say, oh, well, they must be doing something right. They've got a thousand over there. Or they've got 600 over there. When that numbers really, do, it is the understanding of the Bible and the spiritual maturity that is going to produce spiritual discernment. So let's pause right now and just answer the question, what is spiritual discernment? Well, we would understand that discernment means not only the ability to, to distinguish between right from wrong, and we mentioned a moment ago, in Hebrews 5 and verse 14 that we have our exercise, uh, we have exercised our senses to discern between right and wrong. But spiritual discernment is deeper than that. It goes beyond just understanding right from wrong. We need to be able to distinguish those things that are primary and those things that are secondary. We've got to look at the Bible and say this is primary this is secondary, the essential. We've got to be able to look at the Bible and look at things and say, is this essential or is it something that is indifferent? And when I say may, uh, indifferent, whether we do it or not, it doesn't matter. It's indifferent. We are going to have to learn what is essential and what is indifferent. We also, brethren, and this is where a part of spiritual discernment is lacking sometimes, we need to be able to determine those things that are permanent and those things that are temporary, those things that are passing. You can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and you can see a very detailed discussion about things that are temporary and things that are permanent. Permanent. I said that this morning too. You can go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and he's going to talk about things that are temporary and things that last forever. And so brethren, the spiritual person is going to be able to look and they're going to say, that's either right or wrong. Well, that is something that is primary. This maybe falls into something less so, so it's secondary or it is essential, indifferent. It's something that is permanent or it's something that is passing. How do we develop that? How do we, how do we develop that spiritual discernment? I ask you to turn to Proverbs chapter 1. I believe that Proverbs um, chapter 1 helps us to grasp the concept of what I'm talking about. You know that Proverbs was written by Solomon. He is writing to his sons 
And he's teaching them to have the ability of discernment. Now notice Proverbs chapter 1 beginning in verse number 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. So what is a proverb? Well, it is a short, pithy statement of truth. That's what it is. It's, it's very short. It's very powerful. The fool is said in his heart, there is no God. That's a proverb, even though it comes from the book of Psalms. It's this short statement of fact. And so he says that uh, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, watch this, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, equity. Verse 4 he says to give subtlety to the simple, to the young knowledge and discretion. So as he's writing these proverbs, he's telling us what these proverbs are designed to do. Well, they are designed to help us understand wisdom, to help us understand instruction, to help us understand what justice is and what judgment is and what fairness or equity is. That's the reason the proverbs were given to us. He says that we will receive instruction in this manner, but it also helps us to give understanding to the simple. That's verse 4, subtlety, understanding to the simple and to the young man. And obviously he's writing to his son, but we would understand it applies to men and women alike. So he says that we want to give wisdom knowledge and discretion to the young man. He says in verse 5, a wise man will hear. Remember we said a moment ago from Hebrews 5 and verse 11, they were dull of hearing. So one of the keys to discernment is the ability to listen. So as you look at Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 5, a wise man will listen. And brethren, when we're having a discussion about the rightness or wrongness of a particular thing, we must first of all stop and listen to what the other person is saying. Because we have a bad habit, and I know this is true, but we have a habit, we're listening to someone, and as we're listening, we're not really listening, we're already in our mind thinking, how am I going to answer that? How, how am I going to come up with something to answer that? Instead, and that's the reason when somebody starts talking, you're in a discussion, and you start talking, and, and right in the middle they say, well, well, wait a minute, what about this? And you're like, let me finish. <laughs> and then we, we can understand, but you need to learn to listen, to hear. A wise man is going to listen and hear And when he does, he will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. He says to understand a proverb. So these these pithy little sayings that are written in the book of Proverbs, we learn how to understand them, answer a fool according to his folly. And then he says in the very next verse, this is Proverbs 26, answer a fool not according to his folly. So is that a contradiction or is there a truth that he's giving us? Well, obviously it's not a contradiction. So he's telling us we need to learn to answer appropriately with the appropriate words. Sometimes the appropriate words are nothing. Answer a fool not according to his folly. Don't even go there. And we do that sometimes, don't we? We say, I'm not, no, that doesn't even deserve an answer because it's so ridiculous, doesn't deserve an answer. But then sometimes we will answer a fool in the way that he has spoken to us. Answer a fool according to his father. So he says that these words are given, verse number 6, to help us to understand a proverb, watch this, and the interpretation. So I understand the proverb, but then I understand the application of the proverb. 
And by the way, brethren, if I don't ever study the book of Proverbs, I'm never going to know how to do that, right? I'm never going to know how to do what Solomon said. This very book is designed to do. And so he goes on to say that the interpretation to understand a proverb, the interpretation of the words of the wise and their dark sayings. He's not saying dark in the sense of evil. He's saying dark in the sense of deep. There are some subjects, brethren, that are deep. And we've got to be able to understand those deep sayings. Well, how does it all start, Solomon? Verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now that goes back to what we said a moment ago. Brethren, if we are going to have spiritual discernment, we need to understand that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Our basis of understanding is the Bible. That's why, brethren, when we get in a discussion with someone about, for instance, the age of the earth, and they want to talk about the age of the earth, and they want to go to billions of years old, we're starting at two vastly different points. And we've got to be able to take them and get them to understand our basis is the Bible, and the Bible is right, and we can prove that it's right. And so we're not going to go with the idea that the earth is billions of years old. The Bible teaches us implicitly that God created the earth about six to 7,000 years ago. So when you listen to the weatherman and he starts talking about things that happened 200,000 years ago on the globe, you can already see he's starting from a flawed principle. That's why this doctrine of uniformitarianism, which is where everything is always uniform. How did the Grand Canyon form? They say, well, millions of years of the Colorado River just carving out. It took me, and now they've, they've, they've said, well, we're wrong about that. It, it, didn't, it didn't form over millions of years. It actually formed very rapidly. But then they'll say, I think it was 200,000 years ago, whatever number that they used. So, so they, they, they've already said, well, we were wrong, and it took millions of years. Now we're going to go, well, it, it, it was relatively quickly, but it was a long time in the past. So, brethren, we've got to develop ourselves to understand when discussions like that come along. When it comes to, brethren, um, the oneness of the church, this is something that, that people struggle with. And I'm not talking about just those in the religious world. I'm talking about even among members of the Lord's church. Well, is the one church, is it the church of Christ? Or is the one church all different so-called Christian churches just lumped into one body? And we know that dog don't hunt. There's no way that's going to work. And so, brethren, these are things that develop from spiritual discernment. So he tells us in verse number 8, I know I've got ending in verse 7, but I want us to notice verse 8. He said, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Going back to the necessity, as Paul would say in the book of Colossians, parents, you've got to bring your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. He says in Ephesians, ye fathers do it. He tells us in Colossians, parents do it. It is a joint effort working together to bring our children up. And so he says, hear the instruction of your father. Don't forsake the law of your mother. They shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. So brethren, God's word educates us to have mental, spiritual discernment and moral skillfulness. And when we're talking about morals, brethren, our nation right now is vastly misunderstanding moral principles. We know that we have abortion almost on demand still in our nation. 
And when you talk to people, they say, well, it's my body, my choice. Well, how are we going to answer that? How are we going to tell people, well, no, that's not right. Well, first of all, we begin with the idea that a babe in the womb is not the mother. It's not the mother's body. It's the baby's body that's in that womb. It's not the mother's body that's in the womb. It's the baby's body that is in the womb. And until we get people to, and they say, well, no, it's just a fetus. And so a fetus is not a baby, they would say. Do you know a fetus is just Latin for baby? But in our society, what people say, well, it's not a baby, it's a fetus. <laughs> That's like saying, it's not a baby, it's a baby. Well, that doesn't make any sense. And we, we've got to be able to get people to understand that. And so when someone tells you, well, it's a fetus, ask them, what is a fetus? What is a fetus? What does that word mean? What's the, the definition of the word? And you know what they'll usually say? Well, it's a clump of cells. So you're saying that a baby's a clump of cells just like cancer's a clump of cells. And so if someone has cancer, we take it out. So are we going to say those things are the same? That's where we've got to have spiritual discernment, brethren. It's why we have to have moral skillfulness to answer the arguments of those that are arguing against the Word of God. And it begins, brethren, as we've already said, with an understanding of the Word of God. So it's this mental ability to judge between specific circumstances and discriminate between what is right and what is wrong. So as we think about this, let's turn to Proverbs chapter 3. So moral skillfulness is the strength to do what is right, the tools and the motives and the courage and the comfort that comes from our trusting in the law of the Lord. Proverbs 3, begin with me in verse 1. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Now watch this. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Again, when you understand the writings of Solomon, he's giving us a general principle. He is not saying that if you follow the Bible, you don't have to worry about dying young. And yet, that's what many people say. Well, that means that if I, if I do what Solomon said, well, I'm going to live a long, productive life. Well, that's the general rule. But it's not. there are exceptions to these rules, right? That's moral discernment. He says, for length of days, verse 2, and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shall thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God. Watch this. And man. People still today, even though there are some that mock and ridicule it, a man that stands on godly principles in most instances, is still revered. And they may not like some of the things that he says, but they still acknowledge that this man is a wise, prudent man. Now some are going to mock and ridicule that. We're talking about in generalities. And we understand that most people still respect the person that has been with their wife for from their youth. You've been married... 40 years, people say, wow, man, that, that's, that's a long time. You don't hear that. What's the secret to being married that long? See, they want to know, what is your, well, what is the secret? Well, it's this book. That's the secret. If you want to know how people stay married, look at the book that is the guide on marriage. And so he goes on to say, trust in the Lord, verse 5, with all thine heart. Now we're talking about spiritual discernment. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, watch this, and lean not unto thine own understanding. So, so when, I, when I come to a, a, a problem, 
and, and, and I'm, I'm struggling with a problem and maybe it's because there's something going on in the family and, and, and the family tie, we, we recognize the strength of that family tie. And so we look at this and we say, well, you know, it's family so, so I can make an excuse. It's family so I'm going to say it's okay for my family to do this. No, Solomon said, you trust in God and don't lean to your own understanding. Verse 6, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. He tells us in verse 7, be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel, navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of thine increase. As we consider this, brethren, we know that people can judge the weather by the sky. Turn with me to Matthew 16. That's absolutely nothing new. Uh, you know, you hear people walk out and say, Oh, I think we've got a cloud. It's going to rain because they look at the sky. The Bible says in verse 1 of Matthew 16, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting him, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. They wanted to have this great sign. Jesus has already, brethren, committed innumerable healings and miracles. He's done miraculous things. He's taught in a way in Matthew chapter 7 when he gets done that the people are amazed because he taught as one uh, not like the scribes but having authority. So they, they, they know... Jesus has taught in a way that is beyond human understanding, we would say. They've seen the miracles of Christ over and over again, but to them that's not enough. And by the way, you can drive down a peg right here and understand. The world right now is in the very same condition. They, they don't want to look at the miracles of this Bible and acknowledge that Jesus is who He says He is. Brethren, I don't have to personally see a miracle to understand that it happened. All I need is eyewitness testimony. And we do that in every field right now in our world. How do I know that George Washington lived and was the first president of the United States of America? Have any, have any of you old enough to remember seeing George cut down that cherry tree? Well, we know that we're not, and that's facetious when I say that. But you understand what I'm saying. We trust the information that we've get, we're given. And we do that in every field. And yet when it comes to the Bible, well, it doesn't mean anything. We can chunk it out. No, you cannot. So they were wanting a sign, even though he had given them sign after sign after sign. So he answered and said unto them in verse 2, when it is evening, ye say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. We even make little uh, pithy sayings, but a little proverbs about that. Uh, red sky at night, sailors delight. Well, what does that mean? When they see the redness of the sky, they realize, well, it's going to be good weather. But he goes on to say, and in the morning it shall be fair, or excuse me, foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. So you walk out, you see those clouds, and you say, oh, we're in for a storm today. You can especially do it in the summertime when you see those clouds start popping up, and you're like, oh, we're fixing to get us a good summer rain like we got today, except it's not summer. So he says, look, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky. Now watch this, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? Now, brethren, we realize that Jesus gave no signs about when he's going to return, right? No man knows the hour, Matthew chapter 24, about verse 36. No man knows the day nor the hour of the coming of the Son of Man. So there aren't signs in that sense, brethren, we understand that. 
But we know that during the last dispensation, the Christian dispensation, that men are becoming worse and worse and worse, right? Doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. All we've got to do is look at the Bible and understand the teachings of the Word of God. So he says, you can discern the face of the sky. Why can you not discern the signs of the time? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and he departed. Brethren, we need to learn to have the ability to discern the things that are going on around us. We need to develop our spiritual discernment to the point that when we have discussions that are going on, we know from the Word of God how to answer those things. Now, brethren, I'm not saying you've got to have a, 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 a photographic memory where you can just call up verse after verse. I wish I could do that. <laughs> I wish I had that kind of memory that I could just remember, oh, it's over here. Uh, but I don't have that kind of memory. Most people don't. I know very few people. I've met maybe two or three people that have that memory like that. Some, some of them on the verge of being a photographic memory. When we were in Abilene, we knew a guy that was in the Guinness Book of World Records because of his memory at 12 years old. So he was very brilliant, and, and he could remember things, and, and it was so frustrating because <laughs> he could remember stuff, and you're like, how do you know that? How do you remember those kind of things? But brethren, we're talking about not just being able to go to book, chapter, and verse, but having the wherewithal to know how. You know, I, I may not be able to give you the verse right now, but if you'll give me a few minutes, I'll get you the verse. And we've talked about it many times. That's where one of these things, mind-boggling, that you can pull up the Bible, type in a word, and it will give you every time it's used in the Bible and give you the meaning of the word. So we have tools that are available to us all around us. Learn to use those. Then learn to apply those principles where we have spiritual discernment. It is so lacking, brethren in the church, and in our society. So as the people of God, let's make this commitment. I'm going to go to the Word of God. It's going to be my go-to. And I'm going to start there, and it's going to filtrate through every aspect of my life. Then when I'm faced with a question, I'll be able to know how to answer it. And I'll be able to answer, well, is that, is that primary? Or is that secondary? Is that something that is essential or it's non-essential? Is that something that is permanent or is that something that is passing? We've got to develop that in our lives. Brethren, it's vitally important. So this evening, we've talked about spiritual discernment. I want to just remind you, if you are not a child of God, spiritual wisdom, spiritual discernment, is going to be, I'm going to obey the gospel this evening. Mark 16 and verse 16, the Bible says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. If you've never done that, Brother Britt's going to be leading us in this invitation song. We're pleading with you to respond. As a child of God, if you need prayers, we're certainly willing to pray with you and pray for you. So if it's convenient, please come as we stand.